Charles, it's really good to speak to you again. We put out a piece with you about a month ago called An Epidemic of Control that seems to have done really well. Since we put that out, I've been working quite a lot on initially stories to do with the David Icke appearance on London Real and to issues to do with particularly free speech, censorship and conspiracy theory. And as I was working on it, you brought out another piece called The Conspiracy Myth. And you echoed so many of the pieces that I was that I've been thinking about, been writing about, been uh, making a film about. So I really wanted to get you on, and maybe we can kind of explore some of these topics together. But firstly, just because I know that people that this is a, a topic that people get very exercised about, get very energized about. I think we'll let's start by unpacking what you mean by the conspiracy myth, because I think people might kind of react to that in in some way. Right. Uh, generally, people react to it with either a big sigh of relief that I'm not one of those conspiracy people because here I am calling it a myth, or with indignation uh, because now I'm smearing them with this epithet of conspiracy theorist, which was in fact, well, who knows what a fact is, but was in fact invented by the CIA uh, to discredit people who disagreed with the Warren Commission's verdict on the Kennedy assassination. So yeah, really good question. What do I mean by the conspiracy myth? What I mean by a myth is very different than what I mean by a fantasy or a delusion. I think the key point is that by calling it a myth, you're not saying that it's untrue. <laughs> That's right. I mean, we- and, Right, I'm saying that, yeah, I'm saying that it's true, but the truth may not be literal truth. It reminds me very much of um, the evolutionary biologist, Brett Weinstein's comment about religion being uh, literally false, but metaphorically true. And, and Jordan Peterson also talked about myths being almost hyper true or hyper hyper objects in some way. Right. Yes, I would I would agree with that, uh, with that understanding of it with the caveat that the whole idea of literally true is itself based on a myth. And the myth being the myth of objectivity. The, the understanding that uh, it's a certain uh, narration of what the universe is and our relationship to it, that there's this objective reality outside of ourselves that is unaffected by our story making, uh, that, that the uh, results of experiments are unaffected by the kind of experiment and the intention with which we go into that experiment. So, so if you discard that myth, then, you know, then you've opened Pandora's box, which that this that would be like a whole conversation in and of itself. But um, yeah, like our last conversation, the epidemic of control the, from the conspiracy myth. And this is another illustration of what I mean by it. From the conspiracy myth, the the conclusion is, ah, there must be somebody, <clears throat> somebody in control, somebody controlling us. Let's find those people and do what? Ultimately control them. So in a way, the conspiracy myth is part of the epidemic of control. It's just um, identifying the controlling force as a group of conspirators. And so in, in the essay, what I, what I really meant by conspiracy myth is, is like this arch, arch, theory that the whole world, that the workings of the world can be fundamentally explained by conspiracy. There is somebody behind the scenes pulling the strings and that explains everything. Yeah, this is such an important distinction. And I think, I don't know if we even have language to express it because there seems to me to be such a qualitative difference between conspiracy hypothesis, which a lot of turned out to be true from MK Ultra to COINTELPRO. And we've put out films on our channel about the Epstein case, like that looks very much like some kind of big structure that Epstein was just the front man for those sort of things. Like whenever we talk about conspiracy theory, once we roll those two things together, we're in a very difficult place. But I think there is a qualitative difference between alternative histories, collusion, corruption, and what feels to me, and I think we need to bring in some kind of mythopoetic or religious dimension to understand the latter, which is this sense of an all-powerful force. 
how do, how do you differentiate? Because that, for me, is one of the central problems in talking about this, is we're rolling, it's, I think scientists call it an overloaded term. So conspiracy mm-hmm. theory is such an overloaded term that it's very difficult to pull apart and talk about. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, mostly it's a term of derision. Um, and I was really, like, I'm actually, even in this conversation, I'm noticing um, what tone of voice do I adopt when I said the idea that, uh, you know, a group of evil puppet masters, I'm not sure what I said, but something like the idea that a group of evil puppet masters are pulling the strings and who are, and they're actually in control of the world. Did I say that with a neutral turn, a neutral tone, or did I say that with a derisive tone? If I say it with a derisive tone, guess what I'm doing? I am joining the playground bullies and gaining acceptance by displaying the correct attitude of the in-group. And I wonder, um, so it's not, and I wonder if you, like I read your essay as well, um, which I very much appreciated uh, for its nuance actually. But I wonder if like, if you have that impulse sometimes, and if you're aware of that impulse to kind of establish your legitimacy by criticizing those who are even farther out on the fringes than you are. Because mm. I've been you know, aware uh, of that tendency in myself. Yeah, but I do wonder if it's possible to, to talk about these things from a completely neutral place at all. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've tried to be careful with my language while talking about, like there is, for example, you can talk about, and I have sort of fringe medical figures, but, I, but I've tried hard to talk about that in the context of saying fringe by definition, not part of the mainstream conversation, but I've also tried to frame it as a way by saying, we don't know if this is actually valuable information. Like there have been people, there have been medical figures coming out and saying, for example, the doctor in New York I quoted, who said, this doesn't look like pneumonia, this looks like altitude sickness. And that then two, three weeks later is then incorporated into our understanding of the disease. So I'm trying to talk about this, but even using the word fringe for some people, that's that's yeah. kind of, you're, you're loading your terms, you're pushing people out of the conversation. So I, I don't know if it's possible to use language accurately and not do that in some way. I think you're right. I, I think that the ideal of impartiality is actually impossible because it, it almost by definition, it's like, okay, I'm going to stand on the solid ground, but nobody even agrees on what the solid ground is. There's no consensus about what constitutes a legitimate fact and where f- legitimate facts are to be sourced from. So mm. it's, it's, I think as long as we recognize that, then at least we have the potential to be aware of our biases. Um, and, and even that is, is a process of progressive uncovery. Is that a word? No. Uncovering, discovery. Um, and, and not an ideal that we could ever reach. And that's the yes. kind of like, I, I, I want people to be more generous in their, in their listening to people who disagree with them. Because the, the tendency in such a highly polarized time is to cast them into the ranks of the damned, mm. of the, the, you know, cove idiots or of the sheeple, you know, or of the um, propaganda matrix or whatever. Uh, like institutions are not monolithic. There's, if you even look at, even if you're a fierce critic of the WHO or the CDC, if you're not recognizing that there are actually within that organization, many, maybe even a majority of sincere, ethical, caring people, then you will never understand that organization and you will never understand why they appear to be part of a conspiracy. Because because it's really about the culture of the institution and the environment that they operate in. Just going to butt in and, and say that I think my the most persuasive explanation that I've heard of that kind of the institutional decay that I think has happened to a lot of our institutions. We put out a film with, with Eric Weinstein talking about how since the 1980s, what a lot of these institutions have done have effectively, once you politicize an institution, you take it away from its main 
from its main function. You get people jockeying for hierarchy within it for reasons other than that they're good at doing the thing that that institution is, is designed for. And I think there's some sense, see, this, this is actually an, an interesting parallel because I think that's, that's the felt sense that I think a lot of people are picking up. And that's why I think, it, that's what I think the metaphorical truth of a lot of the conspiracy, like the overarching conspiracy narratives are, is that we, are, we have the, some very, very deeply corrupt, fragile, hollow systems and you look, for example, I look at um, The Wire, David Simon's The Wire, which he called a meditation on the death of America, where he looked at like what happens to the police force when you're basically uh, just trying to meet the stats rather than to do your job. The parallels between the police and the drug gangs, you get trapped in these systems of incentive structures. And that essentially, and then he looked at the media, he looked at teaching, he looked at all of these different systems and said, they're all kind of being hollowed out at the same time. And my sense is we, my sense is that this is what people are picking up on a real felt sense level, that something is deeply off in yes. society. And it's not too it's not too big a leap to say, okay, well who is doing this and who is who is gaining from this? I, I totally resonate with that, that that the conspiracy myth comes from a very authentic, accurate perception that our institutions have betrayed us that they're not serving their declared interests, that they have a secret agenda, uh, that they are the puppets of something. Personally, I don't think that, that, the, that they are the puppets of a group of evil conspirators. I think it's more accurate to say that they're the puppets of a paradigm, of a mythology, uh, of, of a set of interests, of a system of an economic system, um, of an ideology of control. You know, this is what I wrote about in the other essay, you know, that, that civilization defines progress as the increase in our ability to uh, impose control upon the world and to control the other, to control matter, to control society, to control the barbarians, the terrorists, the weeds, the bugs, the bacteria, et cetera, et cetera. So, if we are immersed in that worldview, then we're going to, it's going to look like something is coordinating everybody toward a goal of more and more control. Or if you have, say, like more mundanely, if you have a system that's set up um, a, a medical research system that is uh, funded at bottom in large part by pharmaceutical corporations who make money by patenting drugs then you're going to have a lot of money available to study patentable things. And you're going to have, and that money will have, will have infused the entire system so that if you're a graduate student looking for a good research project, those will be the ones that are available. And that'll be the kind of learning that will be applicable to something that advances your career. So it's not that, you know, you're in the, in the, pay of nefarious powers and you're this venal corrupt fake scientist who's just in it for the money it's like that's the whole cast of of the system like i don't want to say that conspiracies never happen i mean they suppress information like that happens look at viox like so so i'm not like gonna, i'm not like being pollyanna here and saying oh they would never ever do something that corrupt they do things that corrupt. Um, I think the, that, but, but I think more often it's unconscious and systemic, which means that you'll never solve the problem by removing the bad actors. Yeah, my, my friend Peter, uh, I think he said something like becoming, a, we all have to become conspiracy theorists as some kind of initiation. Mm hmm that it's part of a kind of world initiation, like, and we have to, obviously we have to question consensus reality. And I think those of us who've been in sort of, what you, we don't have a better word than spiritual uh, communities to, to kind of, to go with that. But those of us who've been in those kind of communities, questioning consensus reality is, is such an important part of that and awakening to something deeper and awakening to some deeper sense of what humanity is and what our potentials are. But then I guess the struggle, 
the difficulty is not to collapse into another fixed narrative on the other side of that awakening, which is what I've seen a lot of can happen very easily once we've had those experiences. We can have a kind of shattering of an old worldview, but what we often do is we reform an equally solid worldview around some new material that then just kind of, it's, it's part of the same problem in a way, rather than allowing ourselves to remain open to uncertainty and open to the journey. Totally. And often that new worldview is actually the old worldview in coded form. It's just a different form of the same thing. And the real initiation, or like maybe I will say another stage of the initiation is you, you, you go from the default consensus reality to, uh, you know, a conspiracy theory or a cult, you know, it could be anything that's, that's the receiving room for people who have left the old story. And then you're like, actually, that's not working either. Like that has some of the same limitations. And so you go to another one, another one. And that process is the, is, is it's a series of stepping stones into the unknown, into the place of being comfortable with uncertainty and looking at the parts of you that, that, that you've kept at bay by offering them certainty. What comes up when you allow yourself to be in uncertainty, when you allow yourself not to know? That, un that requires undoing some pretty deep programming. In our school system, for example, you're rewarded for knowing. You're rewarded for producing the correct answer. Not knowing is, that's, that's a new habit. And we have an entire scientific ideology that says that, that humanity is converging closer and closer to the literal objective truth, that we are approaching a theory of everything of the universe and a, a technological system that, that says, once we order uh, and uh, uh, affix a number to each object in the world and each person in the world, we convert everything into data, then we, we will be able to rationally and optimally manage this world. So this, this um, prejudice toward knowing and the punishments we've received for not knowing, these, these constitute um, a, a deep programming that really takes some courage and some community uh, to, to undo, to be okay with maybe nobody knows and it's okay not to know for a while. I really like that, Charles, because it, it seems that that's one of the failure conditions right now of politics, of journalism, of, of all these different areas is this people who are claiming to know things, like this air of certainty that everyone seems to be coming in with and it's just falling apart. It's just being obviously challenged because especially under the influence or impact of so much novelty that we're seeing with the pandemic. Anyone who's in a public, any kind of public role who is claiming certainty and they, they sort of claim certainty like a kind of defensive posture, it, everyone is starting to see through that now. And it, it feels like that particular mentality is, is what we're seeing being tested to destruction right now. It's the affectation, like I come from, from sort of traditional media. And I think that more than anything is what people pick up on and really distrust is this sense of the voice from nowhere, this sense of instant expertise on a subject that probably the journalist has just started researching that morning. All of those things, like that air of defensive certainty just seems to be something that's being, that, that to me is like right at the core of what's being undermined and dissolving right now. Yeah, especially when it comes from the elites, uh, from from you know people with, of, with in positions of social authority, because I think with very very good reason over the last few decades, people have been in growing distrust of the elites and of their arrogance. Uh, you know, if 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 our society has had continued to improve you know, from the post-World War II era, uh, then maybe we would trust our elites. If, if uh, you know, the ecology of the planet were uh, healing and getting better, if social inequality were improving, 
if um, if uh, people's psychological health were improving, if people's physical health were improving, if our social ills were dwindling for the last 30 years, we would probably trust our elites and their pronouncements of what is good for us. But none of these things have been happening. Instead, we've seen growing inequality, growing insecurity, growing psychological distress, depression, anxiety, uh, declining health, autoimmunity, um, uh, addiction. <laughs> no, no. So, so somebody comes and says, listen to us. We have your best interest at heart and we know what we're doing. Our lived experience does not confirm that in the way that it might have in 1965. Well, I think it's I think it's centrally important to recognize where we are thinking in religious terms and how frequently we're, we're thinking in religious kind of mythological language, because my, my sense is with with the most. Again, we come to this problem with with terminology, but when I'm thinking about kind of all encompassing conspiracy theories, for example, David Icke uh, talks about a murderous cult who are running everything. You have QAnon and the Cabal, like those for me feel qualitatively, whatever the word is, the sort of all encompassing religious narrative there in, on this side of it. What I find really fascinating about those is that even though you could argue that, that there's very dark material in there, there's kind of the idea of sort of um, evil, evil cults, evil small groups of people, they're actually rapture ideologies because they're saying, if only we could expose this defined group of people, then the better world is just the other side of that. If we could only only kind of overthrow the cabal, if we could only expose this evil cult, and it could happen today, it could happen tomorrow, utopia is at hand. Like the deep Christian roots of a worldview like that, I think have to be really made explicit and, and seen for, for what it is. Um, because I, I'd like, if, if only the world was that simple, if only it was that easy to, to achieve utopia. Totally. I mean, that's a perfect example of, of the new story being actually the old story in different form. The old story being progress through the conquest of evil. The conspiracy narrative is very much the same. You know, it's we're going to expose the core of evil and overthrow it and a better world paradise will be at hand. The, the, the dominant story is the same. Evil taking the guise of chaos, of the wild, um, of the, the, um, you know, the germs, um, the unruliness of nature, the natural forces that are indifferent to human well-being. That was, in fact, the, the, the concept of evil was originally associated with chaos and the wild. There are like ancient Sumerian uh, inscriptions to this effect that, that, you know, the good king goes out and conquers the barbarians, drains the wetlands, cuts down the forests, slays the wild beasts who are become like the wolf, the big bad wolf. They're evil and the sheep is good. The weeds are evil. The corn is good. The barbarians are evil. The civilized people are good. That's where evil came from as a concept. So, so, and, and it, and it leads to an ideology of progress through domination because we're always good, you know, and they're evil. So yeah, it mutates into conspiracy theory, but in my view, that's not actually a very fundamental revolution. It's still exploring the territory of separation of control and, and to, to molt beyond that, um, you have to go through the territory of, again, of unknowing. Uh, so yeah, I think that's very perceptive, David, that, that um, you know, the, the, the coded Judeo-Christian dimension to the conspiracy theories. I wondered whether you also get the sense that there's kind of, I don't know if it's a new phenomenon, but it certainly seems to have accelerated under the, under the kind of impact of the pandemic of spiritual communities, new age communities, 
But, like it's very difficult nowadays to see to kind of tell where some kind of all encompassing conspiracy narrative has come from, whether it's come from sort of the more traditionally kind of pro Trump right wing sources or it could have come from sort of more left wing natural news new age places but like there seems to be this coming together of 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 the of these narratives in a really strange way have you noticed that accelerate i can't tell right from left anymore i mean i thought it was supposed to be the leftists that were eating organic food and using natural medicine and doing home births and saying question authority don't trust the man and and now all of that in the in the uh, context of COVID, uh, that's being associated with the right wing. I'm like, hold on, I thought it was the left that was supposed to doubt authority and rebel and stuff. So it's it's on the bright side. I think that this is pointing to the possibility of a new populism, an authentic populism that transcends current political categories, and that would draw from both the left and the right from the anarchists and the libertarians. Uh, that basically it's the people who are defecting from the, the establishment from various forms of orthodoxy. Uh, ver, you know, and on the other side are the people who are, who are still um, bought into the orthodoxy. And again, like this is actually too black and white a picture because almost everybody I know is a rebel in some ways and unconsciously orthodox in other ways. So this is not actually an us versus them. This is a process that every person on earth is, is going through this. It's an inner, uh, an inner split or an inner indeterminacy. Um, which side am I on? Actually, maybe the reason that people are so hostile to those on the other side is because the other side represents a shadow part of themselves that they're afraid of. Like there are, I, I, I'm sure that the most uh, viciously orthodox person harbors an inner rebel that is being suppressed, harbors part of them that actually does doubt everything that they themselves are saying. And the, the, the fear of that suppressed part is actually pretty justified because that will tear your life apart. It will tear your identity apart. If you have identified with being right, and if your position in society depends on you being right and depends on this whole worldview being right, then the heterodox positions, the dissenting narratives, these are a literal threat to your identity. So how, how welcome almost it is to have somebody like David Icke as the projection screen for these uh, suppressed shadow uh, rebellious parts that can then be ridiculed and attacked. And the more ridiculous he is, the better, the better he serves that purpose. So you see the the um, uh, guardians of the orthodoxy cherry picking the most ridiculous of the conspiracy theories uh, in order to to de to demonstrate um, the unacceptability of of what's actually in themselves as well. Yeah, that, that's an interesting comparison. I mean, I obviously the the article that I wrote talked about David Icke, talked about David Icke in the context of the London Real uh, interview. But I also have this sense that David Icke should be part of the conversation. Like he's yeah. been saying he's been saying what he's been saying for a very long time. And I don't get the sense with, for example, with someone like Alex Jones, who seems to kind of, I, I don't get the sense that he believes a lot of the stuff that he's saying. He's following whatever the audience is wanting. Conspiracy is entertainment. David Icke has been kind of true to his, stuck to his guns for about 30 years. And I don't think he can be kept out. He can be kind of gatekeep, gatekeeped, gatekept out of the conversation in the way that he has been in the past. Yeah, totally. Part of me resonates with it, let me say. Like part of me uh, feels almost a sense of relief at the idea that there is this 
Luciferian cult that controls the world and standing behind them uh, negative aliens uh, and demonic beings. The part of me that, that breathes a sigh of relief is the part that then can understand, make sense of the world. Not being able to make sense of the world is stressful, We're, especially in this civilization that's so predicated on control. So what David Icke offers uh, is, is a sense-making narrative that delivers people from the uncomfortable state of uncertainty. But I think actually what we need is to stay in the uncertainty even more. That said, um, you know, so, so basically, so I, I, I am wary of the part of me that wants to leap into a new sense, a, a new meaning, a new story to replace the one that I grew up in, uh, the, the conventional one, um, you know, where, well, I'm not, I'm not going to try to recite it. Uh, however, uh, another thing though, is that, that a lot of the data points that he weaves into his narrative deserve attention. There are lower level conspiracies that actually, like we were saying, like that conspiracies actually do happen and governments lie, corporations lie. We, we have, no one should have any doubt that that happens. And, and to look into the possibility that the extent of their lying could be a lot bigger than the ones that we found out about. And David Icke brings light to some of those things. And that, uh, and, and helps, helps it, like another positive thing that he's doing is he's, he's offering people an expanded reality. Our, our, our world's problems are actually technically easy to solve. If only we expanded the scope of, of what we understand to be a legitimate solution. If we expanded medicine to include all of the holistic and alternative medicines that, I mean, I know from firsthand experience, secondhand experience that they work. And there's even a lot of scientific research. Uh, like Artemisia annua is, is, is a well-established anti-malarial drug. And it's the mechanism by which it um, interferes with bloodborne viruses. I can't actually remember. I don't, I don't want to pretend to be scientific here, but there's, there's a lot of science behind it. Let me just say that. Um, so like there's, there's so many data points. And I don't know, like personally, if you've experienced things in your own life that the dominant story of the world encoded in science says are impossible. I have. So, and many people have, like people have experienced, you know, precognitive dreams and psychic phenomena and mystical experiences and anomalous healings and just like, like, like incredible synchronicities that blow your mind. And I think that, and, and experiences with indigenous people and those kinds of technologies, um, I think we need to bring that in. I think that our, our civilization's impasse requires that we reach outside of the world story that we've operated. So the, the conspiracy myth helps us to open to a larger world story because it's saying things are not as they seem. And that is one of the psychic truths that takes form in a conspiracy theory. Even if the details are not literally true, that that psychic truth is crying for attention. <laughs> you get into these uh, into these realms that are beyond what we recognize as prov provable or disprovable. And how do we engage those realms? This is beyond the scope of journalism. It's more entering the scope of 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 fiction, um, of poetry. And fiction and poetry, I think, are uh, essential. They've been kind of marginalized as entertainment today, uh, but they are essential organs of human knowing that we also need to bring in. So I'm, I'm, when I call something a myth, that is not to devalue it. 
I honored David Icke for his work and Lisa Renee and all these other people for their work in telling us a myth and elaborating a myth in giving some form to hidden psychic truths and repressed social truths. I find it interesting as well that these alternative narratives, these myths are coming up in the middle of what is effectively a really liminal space for everyone. Like we just get the sense that the worlds between or the, the distance between these worlds are, are growing ever thinner. We're in a liminal, we're all going through some kind of liminal initiation experience in the middle of this. Yeah, and I think it's going to, this is just the first step. Um, things might go somewhat back to normal for a little while, but we're just getting a taste of, of the uh, dissolving of what we thought was real and permanent and normal, yeah. I think. I agree. Charles, thank you very much for making the time. Yeah, thanks, David. Hey everyone, this is a very quick message about the Rebel Wisdom Festival at the end of May, which was going to be our biggest ever in-person event with 400 people in London. Obviously that's not happening now, but we've brought it online and we've made it free for everybody. Two days of rebellious ideas and profound experiences. So we still have all the speakers that we were gonna have for the festival, including Daniel Schmachtenberger, Nora Bateson, and we're also adding new speakers all the time. We've just added Douglas Rushkoff and Jamie Wheel plus a load of great facilitators offering practices and skills to build up sovereignty, sense-making and connection. So sign up at the link and we'll see you there.